Hey everyone, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are joining me from. I'm so happy that you are joining me. My name is Barton Seaver. I am a chef, author, husband, father, resident, proud resident of the ragged, jagged, delicious coast of Maine, where I am joining you from today in my home kitchen studio, <coughs> which is also my kids' playroom, which is also our living room, which is also just, well, what life revolves around, right? Because food. Aren't we all here for that? So I'm so very glad that you did choose to join me. So uh, this is one of our ongoing series of sort of open office hours, as well as sort of themed conversations around some topic of culinary. Uh, my role with Ruby is that I am, uh, I, I helped build uh, the seafood literacy course that we offer through there. My career has been based on seafood mostly. I had uh, several successful restaurants, thankfully they were successful. Uh, in the Washington DC area, working for Jose Andres, as well as on my own for a while, and uh, worked as an explorer for National Geographic, got very interested in sustainable food systems, and then from there got very interested in public health. All of this has led me through a uh, seemingly nonlinear trajectory to where I am today, and why I am in front of you talking about this topic. But um, before we dive into that, a couple of just logistics things for you. So over on the right-hand side of your screen, just to the right-hand side of my face, that you will see the add question here box. So if you've got a question about anything, drop it in there, please. You wanna talk about unicorn farming? You wanna talk about tilapia? You wanna talk about whatever? I think maybe politics should probably be off the table, just you know, polite forums, but uh, otherwise really any cooking question you've got, throw it in there. I know we've got quite a diverse audience here today. Uh, quite a few of you, if I see that. Yeah, 124 plus and counting. So a lot of uh, the folks in there I have not seen on these events before. So welcome. If you're new to the Ruby family, welcome. We're so happy to have you. Uh, let's see, what else do I do? Oh yeah, in the questions just beneath uh, those with my face on them, there's a couple of links there that I'll be talking about a little bit later. But just beneath that, you have uh, a number of questions that your peers have already asked. If one of those is particularly relevant to you, just click that little heart icon to vote it up to the top. And I'm gonna try and get through quite a bit of material today and we already have a number of questions and I'm sure more will come in. So I don't have a hard out today, but I do have a little boy, my beloved little Alden, who's gonna be getting off the bus here sometime after about three o'clock my time. So. Any of you who have joined me before know that I like to start off with a little moment of gratitude because gratitude and love are the most important ingredients in any recipe that we will ever make. Cooking for others, feeding people food itself is an act of love. It is an act of kindness. And so starting off anything, any meal, any discussion about food with just a moment of, uh, of gratitude is important. So something that I am grateful for today is the, the coming of spring. Right? I live in Maine, so spring is a very fickle thing up here, but uh, on this, my birthday week, I turn 44 tomorrow, uh, we have some very nice weather, and I'm just really excited about that, and I'm just grateful for that, because I get to hang out outside with my boys and my lovely wife. So I hope that you will take some time today to think about one thing that you're grateful for, or many things you're grateful for, and especially any time before you pick up a knife or go to a grocery store or whatever. Just think about how, how wonderful it is that we have food in our lives. All right, and there we go. So we're gonna be talking about brain health. So uh, I've got a little video that we're gonna play here in maybe a few minutes. We're gonna try and play here because uh, that's coming from my colleague and esteemed peer, Steph, Dr. Stephanie Peabody, who is the director of the, founder and director of the Brain Health Initiative a new multi-pronged, multifaceted initiative that is trying to bring brain health through nutrition to the fore of our policy, of our communities, of our own interpretations and, and ideas about food. Uh, she has roped me into a number of different initiatives that uh, all address brain health through nutrition and otherwise. And uh, one of those is a class at Harvard so nutrition and lifestyle medicine for brain health. Uh, and so I am currently uh, co-faculty of neuronutrition at Harvard's uh, Extension School. In our course there, we, I think we have a, a link for that um, 
maybe now, maybe later. But uh, if you if you want to deep dive into that, please dive into that. We are just finishing up our course this semester, but we're going to be teaching it again. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of information about that. Anyway, so yeah. So from a chef to a uh, neuro-nutrition faculty at Harvard. <laughs> yeah, life is good, huh? We can get places. So let's dive in. I want to talk about one thing uh, that might be a seem a little off topic to you, but uh, I'm going to be threading sustainability, environmental sustainability throughout our talk today. Why? Because it's my belief that we, uh, it is no measure of health to be well adjusted on a profoundly sick planet, right? We are products of our environment. The food we eat is a product of our environment. Our ability to keep eating food is by the, the virtues of a healthy and resilient environment. I don't think we can have a conversation about human health and divorce it from planetary health. They are one and the same. Uh, even if we are so fortunate to be able to afford our way towards the best and most environmentally sustainable foods, what we need to ensure is that all people are able to access those. And that is basically the underpinning of our global food systems. So with that, we're gonna dive into some health facts here. And I've got a bunch of notes from my courses as well. Uh, across the board, uh, the global food system is worth about $9 trillion in the value that it creates every year. But the global food system costs us about $20 trillion. $11 trillion of that are in healthcare costs. A lot of that due to obesity, diabetes, cancer, and um, heart disease, as well as poor neuronutrition, which is a principal driver of the difference between health span, how long we live, and our health span meaning how long we live productive, uh, healthy lives in which we are able to do what we want to do. So $7 trillion additionally in environmental cost and $1 trillion in lost economic costs. So ultimately, our food system is not doing us any favors really by any measure, right? So there's a lot to change here. But unfortunately, that nutrition is not often considered in large-scale policy discussions and advocacy around hunger. It's really still dealing with a food system that was kind of created to address early 20th century problems. Uh, and now we have different problems. Um, at the outset, it was really, how do we just feed people? And while we still need to do that, the world produces enough calories to feed everyone on this planet, but not necessarily calories of the right kind coming from the right sources that also foster and beget really great nutrition in our bodies that help us ultimately to thrive. So one of the great things about brain health is that there's a concept called neuroplasticity. And this means that basically we're able to regrow some new brain cells to create new connections in our brain at any point in our life. And so it is not a, a finite uh, bit of material that we are working with, but rather we can take positive actions to improve our health throughout our life. And luckily, guess what? The things that are good for our brain, are good for our heart, are good for our gut, are good for the rest of our body, are also pretty much good for the planet too. So let's dive into some of the particular risks around food. So uh, it's, it's estimated that with obesity in midlife, and over 50% of Americans currently uh, are uh, considered to be living with obesity, uh, there's a three times uh, risk of developing dementia later on in life if you are living with obesity during your midlife. And as I said, 50% of Americans are living with obesity. Um, and another thing to consider is that uh, you know COVID, right? There was a lot of comorbidity around COVID, living with obesity, diabetes, heart disease, whatever it was that uh, caused COVID to be a lot more deadly. Uh, think about how the world reacted to COVID, right? I mean, the response that we gave when, when COVID hit the scene and we said, oh boy, we got to do something about it, right? And over the last three years, COVID has claimed very sadly 7 million lives. Uh, in, in counting. But poor nutrition costs us 17 
million lives per year. And yet we don't have that outpouring, that that crazy bit of just all out humanity on all fronts to get something done about this, right? And so, yeah, as much as we're talking about your brain health today, my brain health acutely within our families maybe, we're also really talking about something that we need to address just as citizens of this planet, of our country, of our communities, uh, to bring brain health and proper nutrition for all aspects of health to everybody on our planet. So I'm not trying to make a make a make uh, an activist out of you. I'm just trying to maybe convince you that this is part of our role as citizens. So, all right, let's get into some of the foods that are actually very good for your brain health. And allow me to say also at the, at the front of this that I am not a doctor, okay? I am not a nutritionist, I'm not a dietitian. I am not a research scientist in nutrition. Uh, I am a chef. I am somebody who has uh, uh, dedicated their lives to healthy and sustainable foods, but I am not able to offer you strict health advice. I am not, uh, I am not necessarily also just well informed enough to answer some of the questions, wonderful questions that I've already seen come through. So take this really as an overview and really from a culinary perspective, that's how we're approaching this today. So one of the biggest things that we can do for our mental or for our brain health, uh, including mental health, is eating seafood that is rich in omega-3 fatty acids. Anybody that's joined me before, you know I'm a seafood evangelist. It's my mission to get more people across all demographics eating more seafood for positive public health, environmental, and economic outcomes. So a couple of facts and figures about seafood, and I would urge you to take a look at seafoodnutrition.org, which is the website of the Seafood Nutrition Partnership, a really wonderful uh, nonprofit group that's whose work focuses on getting people to understand and thus eat uh, the health benefits of seafood. So Americans are recommended by our own government to eat between eight to 12 ounces of seafood, preferably that which is rich in omega-3s, to eat eight to 12 ounces per week. Um, excuse me, pregnant mothers in particular, but Americans in general, that amount. Uh, and yet with pregnant mothers, the average is 1.8 ounces per, per mother per week. Uh, and the American average is just slightly above that. So some of the astounding facts and figures about omega-3s, especially for pregnant and nursing mothers, that a diet rich in both heart-healthy and brain-healthy omega-3 fatty acids can boost IQ points in the child by 7.7 .7 points. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's just a huge increase. And there's just an enormous uh, importance there. In fact, 9% of our brains by weight are in fact omega-3 fatty acids. And there's some pretty good science to say that when humans split off from our evolutionary ancestors, it was because of two things mainly, the, the capturing of fire and the consumption of seafood. Those omega-3 fatty acids helping to really grow our brains into what they are today. Furthermore, if you extrapolate out the benefits of omega-3s to our heart health, to our gut health, to every other aspect of our health, uh, it's estimated that if we reduce our consumption of red meat, as well as increase our consumption of seafood two times per week, especially those seafoods rich in omega-3 fatty acids, 55,000 American lives every year would be saved. A 36% reduction in cardiac mortality incidences, and overall a 17% reduction in health related mortality incidences. Wow. Wow. This to me is not just a culinary issue, it's not a health issue, it's almost a moral issue. Uh, whether or not you eat seafood, um, I respect that choice. But for those of us who are omniv omnivorous uh, or even pescivores, I really do think it's. It's that level of importance to get us there on the seafood. Two eggs per week or more. Um, seafood, people who eat seafood are 20% less likely than their peers to have depression. Um, it also helps to uh, manage diabetes, manage weight, um, moods. I mean, just there's a whole, whole slew of reasons why to eat seafood. 
So let's move on to some vegetables. You know what? I'm going to take a question or two just to engage y'all. We're going to take a question or two, and then I'm going to jump into vegetables. Then we're going to go fruits and vegetables. Then we're going to go into whole grains and then dive into the rest of the questions. So from Ivana P, a popular question here. What are the effects of wine on the brain? Yes. Uh, so there is some science recently that has said that red wine in particular and with its antioxidants uh, are good for the brain in moderation, right? That sounds fun. So unfortunately, there's been a, a more recent paper that's somewhat not debunked, but called into not doubt, but showed, showed a little bit greater context to those earlier studies. Uh, and that was to say that the basically people who have, who were reported to be drinking moderate amounts of red wine uh, also typically fell into higher income categories as well. There, there are associated basically better health outcomes with higher income categories. So there's a little bit of a crossover there in terms of inability to identify exactly where those health benefits were coming from. That said, uh, it, Red wine in particular is, is rich in antioxidants. Alcohol, though, uh, does contribute to inflammation in the body. Inflammation sort of adds to oxidative stress that we feel that we endure in our brains. Um, do they balance each other out? I don't know. I'm not the expert. But a glass of wine, if you are, if that really mellows you out and you have a nice time and it causes you to sit around the table, maybe a little bit longer interacting with your peers, your family, your spouse, your partner, whatever it is. Uh, to me, that's a, it's a pretty good thing. And here's the other, it's really uh, no one thing in small amounts is going to kill you, right? That's not, that's not the issue. It's diversity that we need in our diets. Um, it's uh, yeah. So if a glass of wine, you really enjoy that, great. I, from my perspective, I would say keep doing it. If you're looking for brain benefits from alcohol and you're not currently drinking, I would not recommend you to start drinking. Uh, just the benefits haven't been proven there so much to say it's a recommended thing to start. So there you go. Talk my way around that. So. Another question coming from Pat F. Uh, for those who have suffered from neurodegenerative damage, like demoli, dem demolition, oh my gosh, I haven't slept much, so, which by the way is very important for brain health. Um, like from MS, which foods would you recommend to help with our cognitive recovery? Thank you from Pat. So uh, I am sorry for the troubles that you and or those around you have been facing. And I'm so glad that you are on a path to recovery and looking for uh, great options. So congratulations to you for that just, just alone. So again, I am not a doctor. I cannot make recommendations there other than to say what I am speaking about here today from whole grains, green, leafy greens and vegetables, uh, fruits and seafood in particular, uh, are all going to necessarily serve the whole you well, uh, how they specifically relate to uh, your question and cognitive recovery, I, I cannot speak to, I'm sorry to say. So another one, an, oh, sure, sorry folks, I've got to lock the camera. I've got a fancy camera that follows me around. Okay, I hope that uh, angle is good, Patrick's good. okay. So uh, I have a fancy camera that picks up all of my gesticulations and, and it responds to them and anyway, technology. So from Monica Alexandra T. Great. Hi, Barton. I'm a vegan mom with a vegan nine-year-old daughter. Awesome. What superfoods and nutrients I must provide to the family in order to build a healthy plant-based diet, please? Uh, so therein, again, just diversity is, is really the key. And building habits around sort of diversity uh, and also, I would say, almost the topography of your plate, what's on there. Uh, one thing I would recommend against is that uh, junk food, whether it's vegan or not, is still junk food. Highly processed foods are not great for us. Uh, they often have a lot of nutrients stripped from them. They're often not very good for the planet either. Uh, so even if junk food is vegan, doesn't necessarily mean it's a great thing. So building habits around eating great whole 
foods, meaning the whole grains, meaning whole vegetables, or obviously chopped up, um, whole fruits, uh, et cetera, healthy fats, uh, such as olive oil, um, avocado oil, uh, as opposed to um, coconut oils or some of the, uh, any hydrogenated fats you want to stay away from, even though they're vegan, they're not healthy for us. So palm oil, things like that, uh, stay away from just, again, from its, uh, how our bodies respond to it. And there's lots of healthful options there. So really the key is diversity. Uh, you know, eat in season so that the things that you are eating, what you're putting on the table is the best example of that thing, right? If you're trying to get your nine-year-old daughter to love tomatoes, do you want to give her a February rock hard, slightly pink, uh, you know, grocery store tomato or something August ripe, right? You know, straight out of the sun at a farmer's market. One of these things is going to be more compelling than the other. Uh, whether that's beets, whether it's anything that we eat, even, even dried beans, even dried grains, even corn polentas, things like this. These are all products that even though we think of them as commodity and pantry staples, you know what? Fresh beans, the fresh dried beans from that season past, uh, you know, eaten within that year are just going to be more flavorful. They're going to be better textured. They're going to cook a little bit more consistently too. Just from a culinary standpoint, they're easier to use. There's some wonderful sources out there. I mean, look at your farmer's markets. Uh, look at Rancho Gordo beans, R-A-N-C-H-O space G-O-R-D-O. They're, I think, one of the best bean producers, you know, mass market bean producers out there. You can find the stuff online. Uh, Again, just if you're going to create healthy habits, create a passion for those foods that are going to be the backbone of those healthy habits. So there you go. All right. Another one from Maryland. How do you cook calamari steak, which you recently bought at Costco? All right. Here we go. Uh, so calamari steaks are typically uh, probably a quarter inch to a half inch thick maximum, I would say. Calamari steaks have been, some of the animals have been... Uh, sliced open so it is a flat sheet rather than the tube that the animal is shaped like in it in life so calamari steaks uh, have a te tendency to curl up when you cook when you expose them to heat so if i put it in a saute pan right like this and it curls up well i'm not sauteing very much of that calamari now am i right you're only only the part that's touching uh the pan on a grill, same thing. It kind of curls up and the sides get protected from it. So calamari steaks to me uh, are best cooked over high heat. So a good, a good heavy bottom uh, or good quality saute pan, a good bit of olive oil in there and get it nice and hot till it becomes nice and shimmery. And you can tell that that heat is starting to build up even wisps of smoke though. I don't recommend getting any path, anywhere past that. Season the calamari early. Okay, so one unfortunate thing about calamari steaks when they're processed like that is they, they're sometimes treated with a chemical uh, water retention agent, a, a brine, often sodium tripolyphosphate, something like that. So that is not to season it the way that we season for taste. That is rather just to retain moisture. Uh, chickens, uh, turkeys are often treated with the same thing. And so those cells just become waterlogged. The problem with this is that when you put it in a pan and expose it to that heat, it sort of exudes that liquid and you end up steaming it rather than sauteing it. Salt, which is a humectant, meaning it draws moisture towards it, right? Uh, well, it makes the surface of that calamari steak a little bit moist, right? And moisture is the opposite of sauteing. You want those high heats above 212 degrees to get that caramelization, to get that crust. So if you season it with salt early, like 15 minutes or so, the salt soaks in and thus actually more evenly seasons the whole fish. You're not just eating salt on the outside to season what's inside. You're seasoning more evenly the whole thing. And then you can pat it dry so that you have less surface moisture to it. So you're going to get a better sear to it, a better flavor development in it. And then another thing to do is to put a weight on top of it. So as soon as you put it in that pan, or on the grill, take a couple of bowls and just stack bowls and just put it right on top. Or if you have a, like a bacon weight, 
or a burger weight, something like that. Anything to just weight it down to keep the whole surface area of it touching is a great thing to do, all right? Then you only need about three, four minutes or so cooking. Uh, one side, flip it over another minute and you're done. So the key with calamari as well as with octopus is either cook it very quickly or cook it for a very long time and absolutely nothing in between because it just turns super rubbery. All right. We're going to dive back into some of the content here. So let's talk about vegetables. I'm going to pull up my notes here. So again, diversity with vegetables is key. Government recommendations, health uh, professional recommendations are that half to three quarters of our plate be vegetables, more ve uh, fruits and vegetables, excuse me, a little bit more vegetables than fruits. Uh, whole vegetables are uh, best for our health. Why? Well, because the fiber is intact and any sugars that are in there, any nutrients that are in there are going to be held better by those vegetables when they are intact, right? So if you take a fruit and you puree it in a smoothie, what you've done is sort of artificially or mechanically broken down some of that fiber that slows the digestion process that allows for those sugars to be absorbed slowly so they don't cause spikes in our blood sugar uh, and the associated inflammation, et cetera. So fruit juice, great. Yes, there's nutrients there. Fruit puree, yes, there's a little bit better and there's some fiber. Whole fruits, best because everything is there and you're sort of digesting it the way that, well, humans were meant to digest it, right? Which is we masticate things, we chew them, and then we swallow them, and then we digest them. So humans didn't evolve with a uh, Vitamix blender uh, at our service. So diversity is very important there, really filling out our plates. Also another key, uh, well, another benefit from diversity is that there are, uh, uh, co-association and benefits that eat when eaten together foods help different foods help us to basically better absorb the nutrients from both of those some classic examples are garlic and broccoli when served when cooked together really help in aid in our absorption of calcium tomatoes and olive oil especially those fat soluble vitamins like a d e and k uh, salmon and leafy greens help uh, with vitamin D and calcium absorption, sort of the bioavailability or biouptake of them. And things like iron, that, that nutrient that's so rich in crucif cruciferous vegetables, kale and broccoli. Well, our bodies need vitamin C in order uh, to really absorb that iron. So if we're eating a spinach salad rich in iron with a nice vinaigrette of some delicious you know, red wine vinegar, some mustard seeds, some olive oil, and then some pomegranate seeds or strawberries, etc. Basically, we get more out. The, the sum of those is greater than the parts. Um, talked about eating seasonally and for flavor ripeness. Uh, farmers markets talked about sort of the benefit there. Uh, also, you're participating in an economy that is sort of more principled with building thriving human communities around them. The economic multipliers around farmer's markets are very important. For every million dollars at sales of sales at a farmer's market, it creates 32 jobs as opposed to large commodity farms for vegetables, which for every million dollars only create 10 jobs. So three times more jobs are created from a farmer's market than from basically what we're buying at the grocery store. That is a benefit to all of us. Um, so, I know we all came here for brain health, but again, sustainability is a big part of that. So let's talk about organic versus conventional agriculture. Right? That's a big topic that a lot of us want to know about. Uh, in the links over there, I said that we would get back to those. So the top one is the Dirty Dozen from the Environmental Working Group. And beneath that is the Clean 15. What are those? Well, they're fun little rhyming things, but uh, or little monikers. But what those represent are the 12 fruits and vegetables that are, by when consuming them con from conventional sources, you are most at risk of uh, pesticide uh, consumption and contamination there. The clean 15 are those that are least likely to have any pesticide uh, residue on them. So organics, 
Why does this matter? Well, let, excuse me, let's talk about pesticides for just a minute. So some of the most used pesticides, and there's over 2,000 of them used globally, as estimated by the World Health Organization. Uh, quite a few of them are known as carcinogens. Um, they're just not great for us if we eat them. But they're also really bad for the people who work with them. Um, excuse me, 1,000 pesticides are used. Uh, there's 385 million cases a year globally of acute pesticide poisoning in farm workers. 44% um, of farm workers globally get food po get pesticide poisoning annually. Uh, in, in, even in the US, this is not just globally, uh, averaging about 45% of pesticide related illnesses are from spray drift, meaning it's not just the people putting it on, it's well, people that live in the community. And kids are particularly at high risk for pesticides uh, just because they eat more food per basically volume of body uh, as they're putting on weight as they grow. Plus, uh, they also tend to just be closer to the ground and yeah, <laughs> roll around and stuff as my kids do. So diving into organics then, uh, though there are some pesticides uh, allowed in organic food production, they are all naturally based. Uh, so organic is really about soil quality. It's about conservation of woods, wildlife, and biodiversity on a farm, uh, promoting greater biodiversity. Uh, and it's a really great thing, but organic is really about the process of how something is farmed. There's another level above that that's restorative or regenerative agriculture that's really purposed with the outcome. How healthy are the soils there? And if soil is not on your radar as something to be concerned about and an advocate for, well, no soil, no farms, no farms, no food, right? Soil health is basically the cathedral, is, is what the cathedral of life is built upon. <laughs> soil health and photosynthesis, right? The, those are the two... Those are the two pillars of life on earth. Um, and so organics and uh, regenerative agriculture really do focus on those. And that's a good thing all the way around the board. So those dirty dozen up there, those are crops that are just particularly uh, susceptible to pests or to fungus or any other diseases on those plants. Also, they are, tend to be plants that we eat uh, the whole of versus the clean 15, which tend to be things like bananas, right? Because we peel off the outside of our banana, right? So if anything was sprayed on it, we're basically peeling it off as opposed to a strawberry where we're eating that whole thing. Spinach, uh, there's other things like celery that are just particularly prone to infestations and bug issues um, and also are very slow growth. Like it takes about 110 days to grow a head of celery. Uh, so that's just a long time for things to get at it, right? And so it tends to be the vegetable that, well, in my family, I always, always buy organic celery. Why? Because I'm fortunate enough to be able to. Uh, and, you know, these things matter to me, right? So the clean 15, the dirty dozen up there. Uh, a couple other things about uh, fruits and vegetables from a sustainability standpoint, 40% of all food uh, in the US volume in, uh, excuse me, 40% uh, of all volume in landfills is food waste in the United States. And it's a, a large contributor of methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. So looking at the food that's left in farm fields, the ugly fruit, the fruit that's blemished, just not cosmetically perfect, right? We should be buying that stuff uh, because it is just as good for us. Uh, and you know what? It's really good for the farmers if we buy it. Um, another thing about, seafood, uh, about vegetables is shopping weekly for them. Uh, the, the vegetable, the least sustainable and the least healthy vegetable is the one that you buy and then never eat and throw away, right? So shopping weekly or shopping even every other day, as I'm fortunate enough to be able to do, part of what that does also is it prevents nutrient loss in those vegetables over time, right? All of us, all things uh, lose their vitality you know, once they're picked uh, and left in cold storage, wherever. Um, so that idea of just eating things 
pretty quickly. Uh, a helps to reduce food loss, food waste, but also to uh, increase the nutrients that we're making available for us. Even where we put food in the fridge matters, right? Food, fruits and vegetables, things that really do need to stay cold, put them in those crisper drawers where they're not getting air interaction every time you open and close those doors, right? Flooding the refrigerator with room temperature air. Those crisper drawers really do keep things crisper uh, in better condition and longer. All right. So that's vegetables. And then we're going to get in some whole grains here. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to talk about vegetables in particular is um, getting into... Um, anyway. Uh, uh, what servings? What a serving size is for vegetables. Uh, so, the neuroprotective benefits of them: there's anti-inflammatories, there's antioxidants, there's phytochemicals, polyphenols, flavanols, etc. Those are all coming. So, we should be eating a half, one and a half to two cups of fruit per day, which is one to three to four servings, about a half cup each, and two to three cups of vegetables per day, which is four to six servings, and again, that's about a half cup. Uh, if you are drinking juice, then it would be a three quarter cup of juice uh, makes a serving a half cup of raw or cooked versus one cup. Um, I'm sorry, a, a half cup of raw or cooked leafy greens, one cup of kale, things like that. So those are serving sizes. If that seems like it doesn't leave a whole lot of room on your plate for that giant ribeye steak, you're right. Exactly. Because the proteins that we should be eating, uh, of, of any animal-based protein, really three to four ounces in any given circumstance is all that we need. And you get all the benefits of omega-3s with just that amount of salmon or mackerel, tunas, other, other foods that are rich in omega-3s. All right. From Ken J, please give us a general comment on cooking with sugar and its impact on Alzheimer's or guidelines. So uh, sugar is just across the board bad for every part of our body. It, it's not optimal for every part of our body, except for maybe our mouths. Why? Because our mouths love it, right? Yeah, because it's delicious. Uh, and evolutionary, there's a reason for this, which is that um, when we were hunter-gatherers, uh, sugar, sweet foods are the easiest and most quickest source of calories. And so, well, uh, we were kind of trained to fall in love with them, right? And also fruits, sweet things tend to try to attract us. Why? Because fruits evolutionary you know, reproduction model is that we eat them and then we take those seeds in our body elsewhere and deposit them, right? So fruit wants us to eat it. Sweet things want us to eat it and our bodies have grown accustomed to that. Uh, after that though, sugar is really just not great for our guts, for our immune system. Uh, it leads to a cycle of inflammation and oxidative stress and blood sugar issues. So all the way around, sugar is just not a great thing in our diet. A wonderful thing though, is that it's really quite easy to kind of train ourselves away from those sugar cravings or, or really that omnipresent uh, aspect of sugar in the modern American diet. I think a lot of people would be absolutely shocked if they understood how much sugar we eat uh, in this country. I mean, so it's over 150 pounds, I think, of sugar per person per year, uh, which is just astounding. Um, so uh, a general overview, though, is that fiber is the uh, sort of antidote, if you will. We just learned this uh, last week in a class from uh, one of my other faculty members. So uh, fiber really is the antidote to sugar. Why? Because fiber slows down the digestive process. You know, it is uh, the cellulose tissues and, it, and fiber just slows down the digestive process, making those sugars, well, hit the bloodstream slower, right? And so you don't have those spikes, plus you have the associated uh, vitamins, minerals, and nutrients that go along with them in whole foods. So fiber is very important there. How it relates specifically to Alzheimer's, again, I do not necessarily know, but that oxidative stress, as well as the inflammation that sugar helps to cause in the body are certainly not good uh, for our brains and certainly do lead to uh, less than optimal out health outcomes. So again, 
what's really great for our hearts is good for our brains. And across the board, we know that eating a diet rich in leafy greens, whole grains, um, seafood is very good for us for both our neuroprotective benefits uh, that those foods provide, but also our neurogenerative benefits that they provide, helping us to create new cells, new connections. So there you go. From Marcy J. Hey, chef, I've been out of the Ruby loop. I'm glad to saw this topic. Well, welcome back. Welcome back, Marcy. It's near and dear to me. Dr. Sean and Aisha Sherzal have been a wonderful source for me. I'm not familiar with them, but I hope that uh, others on this uh, event today will look them up. Let's see. Uh, what is one of your favorite and tasty brain food dish or bowl? So, all right, here you go. You've got a, uh, you got your broiler, your toaster oven broiler on, right? You got your rack up here. You get a cast iron pan, something that'll fit in the oven. Like, uh, well, it's not within reach right now, but um, yeah, a cast iron pan or just a heavy bottomed anything or even a Pyrex baking dish, something like that. Put it in there, get it a little bit hot, take some kale, get it nice and uh, sort of massage it with a little bit of salt and some olive oil, cut it into pieces. Then uh, once that's gotten hot, throw that in the bottom. As soon as it begins to kind of crisp and flake and dry out on this edges, throw in a piece of seasoned wild Alaskan or farm or quality responsibly raised farm raised salmon, put that in their skin side up, throw in uh, maybe a half cup or so of cooked farro, cooked quinoa, something like that, a whole grain. So what's gonna happen? Okay, over the course of the next about nine minutes, depending on the thickness of your salmon filet, what's gonna happen is the kale is gonna continue to crisp, that quinoa or the farro is going to warm through, become hmm, so toasty, nutty, delicious, uh, as well as cr you know, crisping just a little bit on the outside. That salmon is going to get all sort of sexy, crispy skinned up on top, like crunchy, delicious. Yay, right? The moisture from the kale is going to help protect it and somewhat steam from the below so that it retains all its moisture and all those wonderful nutrients and minerals and fats that you within it. About nine minutes later, you pull it out and sprinkle over some pomegranate seeds or arils, as they're known. And uh, there you go. That is pretty much a perfect dish. Knock out the olive oil if you want, knock out the salt if you want, uh, but otherwise, you know, hey, there you go. And it's all pretty easy. You know, grains come now in, in pre-cooked packages that are vacuum packed that are shelf stable. So they're a pantry item. We're going to get into grains here in just a, a minute, but um, some tips and culinary techniques on that. So, I mean, wow, how easy was that, right? One pot dish. Well, you got a cutting board, you got to wash, you got a knife, you got to wash, and you got a dish in, in the, stove, in the uh, toaster oven that you've got to wash. Of course, you can do it in an oven too, but there you go, one pot meal, pretty awesome. And all your vitamins, minerals, flavonoids, all that stuff is there. And it's satisfying, right? It gives us a feeling of satiety. It's got different textures to it. And food, in order to be good for us, has to actually get into our bodies, right? So if healthy foods taste really good and are texturally interesting, color you know, varied so that are, they're visually interesting to us that are aromatic and smell great, and have a diversity of bitter to sweet to salty to sour in them that are just well balanced, right? Well, those are actually healthful foods because we're encouraged to eat them and then eat them again another day because the dish was so satisfying and delicious and made us feel good, right? There you go, cool. Oh, uh, one study that I wanted to mention, uh, this is part of the, the reading that we had assigned in our course, is there was a, a study in Taiwan that uh, showed that seniors who in the upper quintile uh, of leafy green consumption uh, exhibited brain health or brain cognitive capacity that was 11 years younger than their peers on average. So leafy greens are really, uh, when it comes to just please for your brains, for your family, for people around you, just a cup or two of leafy greens every day is really one of the very best things that we can do for ourselves as part of a diverse and rich diet. So there you go. Hilda P. Hi, friend. It's so nice to see you back here. Hope you and family had a great Easter. We did. Unfortunately, there was far too much sugar involved. 
sorry. To stay above dementia, what substances and seafoods contribute and are most helpful? So really that's the omega-3 fatty acids. So EPA and DHA uh, are key to that. So those are the long chain fatty acids. The seafoods that we most want to go for are really those oily rich seafoods. So fish like cod, flaky white flesh fish, store most of their fats in their liver. Why? Well, because they're ambush predators. What does that mean? They kind of sit there until, boom, until they catch something, right? So they need what's called uh, fast twitch muscles. So they, something that, uh, did I get that wrong? Anyway, their muscles are meant to basically be at rest until they're needed. So they don't need to store a lot of energy in the form of fat inside those cells, inside that muscle tissue, as opposed to a tuna or a salmon, which spends its whole life swimming pretty vigorously, right? Those muscles need that fat to be stored intracellularly, intramuscularly. Why? Well, because those muscles need those stores of energy to call upon as they move constantly. The difference here, think about chicken breast as opposed to chicken legs, right? One of these, one of those muscles does something all day, right? Chicken breasts just kind of sit there. They don't really flap their wings a whole lot, right? But those legs are walking all day. Same thing, um, <clears throat> fish that tend to be darker in color <clears throat> or colored oily fish are really the ones that are very, very good for us that have those high levels, high concentrations of omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, we're hoping that you get 500 to 750 milligrams of EPA and DHA a week cumulatively. Uh, one portion of farm-raised or sockeye, coho, or king salmon uh, is going to have a thousand to 1200 milligrams of omega-3s in them. So we can very easily get those recommendations and more uh, by eating fish that we, we know and love. And uh, you've joined me before, so you know about my, my love affair with canned seafood up there. Guess what? It's a really great source of omega-3s. Why? Well, because the fish that go into cans tend to be those high oil fish, herring, mackerel, sardines, anchovies, salmon, tuna, right? Those are the ones that we really should be eating for that optimal health. That's not to say that cod shouldn't be on your table or flounder because those are absolutely delicious. Uh, but they're just, uh, they just don't pack that omega-3 punch to them. So there you go. From Beth A, any food suggestions to help prevent dementia or to help someone that already has it? I, I don't know much about the uh, you know, reversal or, or helping, but really uh, that fact that I mentioned at the outset that uh, people who in midlife are living with obesity are three times more likely to get dementia. <clears throat> really, it's about eating a diversity of healthy foods, mostly plants and whole grains uh, throughout our life. That really is the key. That idea of neuroplasticity, that we can still create new uh, pathways and connections in our brains is, a, is very powerful. Uh, as to reversing the course of dementia, I, I don't know and cannot speak to that. So, but really it's those omega-3s, whole grains, leafy greens, and fruits. So there you go. All right. From Tyrrhenia, Tyrrhenia. Uh, happy birthday before your birthday. Well, thank you very much. What foods are really brain foods? The internet has some, uh, so many videos and some are pretty questionable. Yeah, a lot of them are pretty questionable. So the Cleveland Clinic uh, does a really good job at outlining brain healthy foods. Uh, the Mayo Clinic does a really good job of this. Uh, the Brain Health Initiative is building a lot on this nutrition source, uh, Harvard's sort of go-to guide for all things nutrition and the very best and most up-to-date science. So nutrition source is really probably the first one that I would go to, to as a web resource for this. Otherwise, I've already, already dove into what categories and, and sort of how to treat them. So there you go. Cool. How about saturated fats in the brain, butter and cheeses? I don't really know. Uh, I know that there, there are some inflammatory process, uh, aspects to those, especially with, with highly saturated fats uh, that are just not good for 
well, the rest of our body and particularly really for our gut and our gut bacteria, the microbiome that is there, that is, it has a huge effect on our brain health. Uh, in fact, the vagus nerve uh, that connects our stomach to our brain. Uh, an interesting little fact is that in, in the embryonic stage, the, uh, the brain and the gut both come from the same cell that splits off and becomes, so they are uh, intimate, really, intimate, really, re intimately related all the way down to the cellular level. Uh, I don't fully understand the science of that, so I won't dive into it, but uh, two things that come from the same thing must, must be related in my opinion. Um, so those saturated fats and butters are really, they're not optimal for our gut health, for that microbiome there. They're not optimal for our uh, overall health, for our cardiovascular health, for our weight management as well. So those all play a role into you know, overall, overall health, but also brain health. One caveat to that is that if a small pat of butter put on top of some broccoli is going to get that broccoli into your face, mm, it's a pretty good use of butter and calories in my opinion. Uh, and really, I think a, a common sense approach to this is the dose makes the poison. Um, Right. And if a small amount of butter actually gets the large amount of broccoli <laughs> or kale or whatever it is in, into your body regularly, then it's a pretty good use to me. Uh, that said, olive oil on broccoli is really delicious. Right. So there you go. Try it out. There's some really buttery olive oils too out there. All right, Marcy, uh, would love to see you do a culinary walkthrough of the cuisines, blue zones, et cetera, as a follow-up to this. Well, thank you for that suggestion. I really appreciate it. So uh, Elizabeth G, following up, I knew this question was going to come from someone about mercury. How do you know if mercury is in seafood? Other than seafood, what foods are good for brain health? So I've answered uh, the second part of that question there. How do we know if mercury is in seafood? Uh the Environmental Working Group and uh, EDF, the Environmental Defense Fund, has a, a good uh, list of what foods are best choices for us, as well as which seafoods to avoid, in particular for methylmercury. Uh, and, but typically, for the average person, uh, unless you are pregnant and nursing, pregnant or nursing, uh, really the health benefits of seafood outweigh the risks of methylmercury poison. It's best to stay away from eating a whole lot of those seafoods that are high in methylmercury, basically tile fish from a particular area uh, off the mid-Atlantic coast, king mackerel, marlins, sharks. What's the commonality there? Well, most of those are very long-lived big species that eat a whole lot of fish, right? And so bioaccumulate just more and more of those toxins. Um, some tunas are uh, at, have elevated levels there, but most tunas do not and are in fact quite healthy. And in fact, the overarching consensus is that it's more dangerous to not eat seafood than it is to eat any kind of seafood. If you are a 65-year-old male, uh, in pretty good condition and you're really just looking for the cardio protective benefits uh, from seafood, really the answer is just seafood. But the vast majority of the seafood that we eat is really quite low in mercury. Plus seafood also has selenium in it, which is a key and essential micronutrient that we need for our bodies, but also helps to prevent uptake of methylmercury from dietary sources. Um, sort of the co, uh, the just, so it actually helps to block that. So the overarching consensus again is eat seafood, eat seafood pretty often, eat a diversity of seafood in small, sustainable, appropriate portions, and really you're going to be okay. If you're a pregnant and nursing mother or interested in getting pregnant, uh, really just look for foods lower on the food chain. Sardines, mackerel, herring, uh, clams, mussels, oysters, uh, eat salmon. Sam none of the salmon uh, from either farm raised or or wild capture have any toxicity concerns around methylmercury. So there's just a huge abundance of fish that are very safe to eat, and in fact, really promote optimal outcomes for our neurogeneration as well as uh, neurogenerative uh, outcomes, as well as help to prevent against postpartum depression and a whole lot of things. So. Basically, 
you want optimal health, don't smoke, wear your seatbelt and eat seafood. There you go. All right. Judith T. Oh, hi, friends. It's so nice to see you. We're trying to keep up with the grandkids, so you love this topic. Thank you. I'm also really enjoying the wine pairing salt, and I find myself using one every day. Oh, they make great gifts. So this is not a question. This was just you complimenting me. Why, thank you, Judith T. I always appreciate you. You're awesome. Would love to see you do culinary walkthrough. Okay, already got that one from Marcy. Okay, uh, another one or one from Teresa. My partner suffers from calcium, oh, just jumped on me, oxalate kidney stones. What specific foods for brain health do you recommend that we can eat for both or both eat? Thanks. You know, I don't know enough or really much about uh, causalities of uh, kidney stones. So I'm sorry, but I don't have an answer for you that. I think if there's enough questions like this, we might uh, be tempted to bring on some of my uh, neuronutrition faculty there, some who are some of the preeminent doctors uh, working in this field who are able to answer some of those questions. But uh, you know what? I'll also send that question over to Uma, Dr. Uma Naidu and uh, see if I can't get you a good answer for that, okay? So uh, Patrick, talking to you here, if we could... Um, star that question for a response from Tammy. Are there any foods that can benefit a neurological disorder, specifically spasmodic dysphonia? So interested to learn more. Uh, again, I, I'm sorry. I don't know uh, anything along that lines to give you a good enough answer. Apologies. I'll try and follow up with you as well. All right. We have a bunch more questions. So I'm going to go through whole grains very quickly here. Uh, a couple of really Terrible things about whole grains from a just a American perspective is that uh, less than 1% of the US population consumes the recommended intake of three servings per day of whole grains. Well, less than 1%, which means that uh, on this event today that, um, well, very few of us, less than two of us are actually eating our whole grains if we average that out, right? Wow. That means we all have a long way to go, but guess what? Whole grains are delicious and they're very easy to incorporate into our diets. So what are whole grains? Uh, so grains in general, there are the, the seeds of, of, of grasses. So oats, barley, quinoa, corn, all those. There's a whole lot of different whole, uh, whole grains out there. They're becoming uh, much more accessible to us. Uh, there's a lot of new neuronutritive benefits to whole grains, especially the fiber. Um, just, well, <coughs> excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, fiber, unfortunately, a lot of what we do for whole grains is we mill them down into refined grains, right? Which strips out the endosperm and the germ, um, and basically we're left with, or I'm, I'm sorry, it strips out all but the endosperm, which is the soft, flaky, uh, you know, fluffy white flower on the inside. And really all, a lot of the nutrients are, well, taken out with that process as well. It also makes them a lot easier to digest, thus uh, leading to uh, well, not as optimal outcomes for blood sugar and weight gain and all sorts of stuff. So whole grains, they're becoming more and more available. There's great brands that are available in just about every store now. Uh, if you haven't heard of the whole grain that's available to you, well, guess what? <laughs> it all pretty much cooks the same, whether it's wild rice or brown rice or white rice or uh, polenta or farro or anything else. So uh, one of the tips that I do with, with whole grains is, you know, yes, I buy those packaged ones that are pre-cooked. Why? Because I have a two-year-old and a six-year-old and... Uh, I'm busy, as are you. So yeah, those are perfectly fine. Uh, there can be some uh, issues with salt if you're trying to avoid that in your diet. Those can be just the amount of salinity is taken out of your hands, right? So cooking them from whole at home is super easy. I really like to toast them first. I really love olive oil. So a couple tablespoons of olive oil and a nice heavy bottom pan toast those grains until they just begin to smell nutty. Basically, you're sort of activating those essential oils in them. It just draws out the flavor and just, I think, makes it a little more interesting as well as adds a little textural contrast that I particularly like, a nice little snappy elastic bite to them that yields into a really a pleasant chew. 
Then add stock or water. And uh, I make a lot of vegetable stock, chicken stock, whatever it is, but you really don't need that water alone. Something that I do use a lot of though is fennel seeds and bay leaves when I'm cooking those. Why? They just make the, they add a whole lot of nuance and interest and flavor to them that I think is really quite uh, attractive. Fennel seeds stay in there. They actually just cook just like the grains do and rehydrate and add a huge amount of flavor, but also their own little textural uh, counterpoint to them. So a couple of tablespoons of fennel seeds. And if a couple of tablespoons sounds like a lot to you and you're like, man, those are expensive. Yes, they're expensive if you're buying the half ounce portions of them. If you buy them as I do by the pound, guess what? A pound of fennel seeds cost about 14 bucks. An ounce of fennel seeds costs about $6. Yep, okay. Uh, one ounce of, or what is it? An eighth of an ounce of bay leaves costs uh, about five or six dollars. A pound of bay leaves, which is literally a bucket full of them, cost fifteen dollars. Right? Okay. Well, great. I'm game for that. And guess what? I use bay leaves by the handful. Why? Because I really like their flavor. Fennel seeds, I use them by the half cup full because uh, I really like their flavor. Another thing you can do that's very healthy and that I really love to do is integrate nuts in, into whole grains from the get-go. What do I mean by that? Well, I toast them along with those raw whole grains, uh, either in a dry pan or with a little bit of olive oil. And then I just simmer them along with the, uh, along with the whole grains. And what does that yield? Uh, a nice flavorful blend that is super healthy, like slivered or batons of almonds, right? You probably got a bag of them around, you put them on your green bean casserole or whatever at Thanksgiving. Those are absolutely delicious when simmered in, they lose a little bit of their crunch, but still retain their texture. And it's just, again, that diversity is there, but also that culinary interest, right? You throw in a couple of chopped olives and some pomegranates or some chopped up strawberries or some orange segments. And there you go. I mean, a cold cup of that with the almonds and farro or whatever it is with just a couple other ingredients and some parsley. Like, wow, that is, you know, is about as healthful as you can get in terms of a combined dish there. And when I say use parsley, I don't mean like, oh, I'm just gonna use a little sprinkle of parsley. No, you've bought parsley before, right? It comes in a big bunch. So use the whole bunch. Use it like a salad green. Just chop up half of it and throw it into a serving. Like, great, there's your leafy green on top of it. And you get vitamin E out the wazoo. I mean, it's like incredible source of vitamins, minerals, and nutrients. And guess what? It tastes really good. And isn't it better just to chop it all up and put it into your farro than it is to chop up some of it and then throw the rest of it away because you never got back to it, right? There you go. So um, whole grains, I see we got a lot of questions coming too. So uh, a couple other things with whole grains. I uh, rec recommended that we eat three to six cups um, or three to six servings each day. That's really not that hard to do. Two servings is one sandwich made with two pieces of truly whole grain bread. Um, enriched grains versus fortified. Uh, so again, fortified is when grains uh, have their nutrients stripped out of them and then put uh, fortified meaning add ingredients that were never in there to begin with like um, vitamin D is in milk and other things like that. That is, that is fortifying. Enriching is when we remove those through processing or milling, and then we add them back in through a chemical means like niacin, riboflavin, uh, et cetera. So that's the difference there. So why just, why not just eat whole grains? They're ultimately very easy to do once we sort of incorporate them into our culinary, um, into our culinary norms. So, all right, I'm gonna dive into a bunch of questions here because I wanna go and I've probably got about 10 more minutes. Where would you suggest to purchase good seafoods when you live in a landlocked location from MLP? Great question. Uh, I would suggest your local freezer aisle. Yeah, so I'm a huge proponent of frozen seafood. I live on the coast of Maine. I am about a hundred yards from a working waterfront. I have fishermen drop off seafood just in my refrigerator, I come home sometimes and there's just fish there that I didn't know was there. Uh, I have access to the very best quality of, of seafood anywhere. And yet my freezer is amply stocked with seafood. Why? Because I have a two-year-old and a six-year-old and I'm very busy. 
And frozen seafood is really a convenience protein. You can take it straight from the freezer, put it in your toaster oven at 270 degrees and cook it from frozen. And it takes maybe 25 minutes. Yeah, that's a long time, but guess what? It takes a long time to overcook it from there. And well, that gives you time to simmer up your whole greens, whole grains, doesn't it, right? And saute up some kale with some dates, chopped dates and some almonds and some uh, sliced up garlic and shallots, right? Woo, okay. Or just relax and not stress about dinner or have a glass of, you know, wine with your whoever you want to and just, you know, don't stress about the process of dinner. So there's seafood. Uh, frozen seafood used to have, it, it used to be very bad. I mean, it just wasn't the best quality stuff, right? I mean, freezing was something we did to sort of prevent spoilage. Uh, but now freezing technology and the economies have of, of seafood have advanced to the point where we're freezing seafood so close to the point of capture, even at times on the boat of capture, uh, that really it's a means not of a, not of stopping spoilage, but of arresting pristine quality. And in grocery stores anywhere, you're going to be able to find that level of quality that's in my freezer on the coast of Maine. So there you go. Also, find it in a can. There you go. Aquaculture species in the fresh case, though, also uh, they just have a longer shelf life because the bacterial content is a lot easier to control in a wild capture situation out on a boat rocking in the middle of the ocean that takes a day to get back into shore, et cetera. And you're piled up with a lot of other fish with ice in the hold of the boat. There's just a lot of bacteria that gets spread there. And that's not a bad thing. It's just, well, the process of spoilage has kind of kickstarted. Right. I mean, this is the case with with anything once it's harvested, whether it's a vegetable or seafood or beef. Uh, basically, the more surface area there is, the more touching there is, the better off, the worse off, the, the, the less the shelf life is going to be. With aquaculture, typically, the just the process is a lot more controlled. The quality of water is under control often. And so you're able to process them in, in really strict regimens that prevent a lot of that bacterial transfer. And so you just have a, I'm not saying a healthier or a more sanitized necessarily healthful, um, wholesome environment. I'm just saying that the shelf life tends to be longer on those. So those species fresh, whether it's catfish, tilapia, trout, farm-raised salmon, Arctic char, farmer shrimp, those are great options in the fresh case. There you go. All right, from Chris E. Hi, friend. Having just recently moved mom into a memory care facility, brain health is top of mind. Interested to hear wisdom and happy birthday. Well, thank you. I appreciate you joining as always. Deborah, happy birthday. Thank you. Wow, so many, so many birthdays. So many happy birthdays. I'm going to eat my kale and my, my seafood and my whole grains, and hopefully we can keep doing this together. Join me. How do you recommend cleaning produce to get rid of any pesticides and or chemicals from produce? From Jose, great question. Uh, so anything that you're going to eat all of, just make sure that you're washing that organic or not, just from grit and you know, grime to, to bacteria, whatever it is, to pesticides. Uh, just a cold water wash is often enough. There are those vegetable sprays, vegetable wash sprays that are sold in grocery stores for quite a bit of money. Uh, you can replicate one of those quite easily simply by mixing a little bit of baking soda uh, or even vinegar with water in a very, very dilute formula. But really all that you're doing there is just changing the pH of that water so that it activates a little bit more and actually helps to break down maybe any fats uh, or any of the cells of those, uh, those pesticides that are on top. But really cold water wash is going to get what you need. Uh, wash fed fruits and vegetables right before using them because washing them is going to decrease their shelf life. So don't get home from the grocery store, wash everything and put it away. Um, that's not the, uh, it's not the best thing to do. Uh, whether you need those vegetable sprays or not, no. And the, really the, the, the fruits and veg or the vegetables that I'm, I would really put any effort into in terms of scrubbing or using those sprays or anything with wax on the outside, like an apple, like a, a rutabaga, anything like that. Rutabagas are not so much of an issue, but apples are often waxed just before heading to market. So pesticides might have been sprayed on that apple and then sort of encased in that wax, right? Uh, and that is a food grade wax. It's um, by, by most accounts perfectly safe. 
but that will prevent the water from getting to those any pesticides that might or might not be there to wash them off. So those vegetable sprays, a little bit of baking soda and water, a little bit of vinegar in water helps to do that, or even just a brush. There you go. All right, Salmon Farm, uh, our store. Oh, I'm jumping up to this up here. What are your thoughts about using brewer's yeast as a supplement? You know what, Lily? I'm sorry. I don't really know anything about brewer's yeast. Um, I'm sorry. I've really never used it in my in my cooking. So I don't have much to add there other than the fact that when people have made things for me with brewer's yeast, I found it delicious. So apologies, Lily. I am not, I am not uh, an expert on all things or even knowing of all things. And it's good to rec recognize where we fall short. So from RCJ, check out the 30 day Alzheimer's solution by Dr. Dean and Ayesha Scherzel. Great content and ideas for prevention as well as for helping those in the thick of the disease. Well, Marcy, thank you for that recommendation. I appreciate that. That goes out to a couple other folks that were asking questions along those lines. From Louis Marie, our, st our store sells bad looking salmon farm raised that is fresh, previously frozen. How do I select frozen that's good for you and is affordable? Sure. So frozen seafood should, uh, much like fresh fruit seafood, just look intact, right? It shouldn't have any areas of discoloration. It shouldn't have any areas of uh, ice crystallization on it. Most frozen seafood, like raw stuff, you know, filet form, is going to be packaged in a vacuum pack. Uh, that vacuum pack should be intact, meaning it hasn't been punctured. Uh, so the, any discoloration in there is a sign that it's been exposed to air and it's oxidized or it's been exposed to water. That ice crystallization in there uh, shows that it is gone through a freeze thaw cycle a little bit, even if it doesn't thaw all the way, if it even gets up to 33 degrees, right? There's a little bit of that ice crystallization. Ice crystals can damage the cell structures uh, and just lead to a lower quality uh, filet just from a eating standpoint, but also uh, can reduce the shelf life of that. And sort of, you know, as soon as it begins to oxidize, as it does with ice crystals as well, it begins to change its flavor a little bit. So generally look for you know, well packaged with packaging intact seafood, seafood that looks inviting to you. If you can see it, uh, it, should, it should inspire confidence in you rather than doubt, right? Um, and uh, you know, look for species that are, are, are very common where there's a, a large frozen industry, specifically with wild salmon, especially sockeye, pink salmon, kita, and coho salmon uh, are mostly very affordable options. And the vast majority of that which is caught is in fact frozen. So there's just a lot of supply uh, and there's a lot of demand, meaning there's a lot of turnover in your grocery store, right? So that's uh, something that's very good. Don't buy too much of it. It's very easy to fill a freezer. It's harder to empty it, right? because my freezer is out in my garage. And I, you know, I just don't always think about it, right? So it's easy to fill things up. It's harder to use them up. And you want to use frozen seafood. You have a couple of years to use it before it's actually not really good to eat, uh, but you want to use it up within six months to a year optimally. All right, from Demetra. Hi, Paul Greenberg's mercury levels are not so hot after eating fish sometimes even the cleanest possible for 365 days. Yes, so this is part of his Omega Man book. Your overall thoughts on safe amounts of sustainable fish per month per year, or do you find plant-based omegas are more healthier due to the methylmercury? Okay. Uh, so Paul's experiment was that he went, he was, he was eating uh, a vast amount of seafood several times a day. Uh, for an entire year for his book project, Omega Man, which is a really great book. Uh, he was eating some of the very clean species. Yes, he was eating a big variety of seafood as well. Basically, he was going above and beyond what most humans, unless you're living in the Arctic Circle uh, and native populations might typically eat of seafood. And Yes, those risks did elevate with that. Uh, in the so uh, sort of an ant, uh, speaking to the opposite of that, uh, I've I've seen studies and it's shown that within pregnant and nursing mothers, 
7% of the methylmercury that is detectable uh, within their bloodstream, only 7% came from seafood. There are other sources of methylmercury, both in our diets and in our environments. So I, it's been a long time since I've read Omega Man, uh, Paul Greenberg's book there. But really what it comes down to is if we are eating seafood within or near the dietary recommendations, which is two or more times a week, eating a diversity of seafood, the benefits so far outweigh the risks, uh, even within specific populations like pregnant and nursing, that uh, it's really just so important to eat that seafood. And if you were eating a diversity of things, seafood, plant-based proteins, a whole range of fruits, grains, vegetables, fruit, and all that, really we're creating a system in our bodies that um, <laughs> is good and you're not you we're, we're not going to go overboard with that methylmercury so all right uh sorry i'm sort of stumbling on myself here again i haven't slept in a while and it's a, a bit of a challenging topic and i love the challenging questions that y'all are throwing at me so all right last two questions that i've got to run hello there i would like to ask what you would recommend one should incorporate in our diet if we we're eating, eating vegan before you mentioned uh being that you mentioned all the nutrients in fish. Sure. So omega-3s are available in the uh, plant-based diet as well. They are more so the uh, ALAs, the alpha lipoic acid, uh, which are short chain omegas. Um, they don't have necessarily the same benefits as do the EPA and DHAs there, but um, a, a diet that is, is rich across the board with a great deal of diversity, if you can, um, you know, lots of nuts, which are great sources of omega-3s, walnuts in particular, flax seeds. Uh, some of those are omega-6s, some of those are omega-9s as well. But really a diverse plant-based diet is, is going to get you where you need. Um, so there you go. One last question. Any pros and cons of eating the skin of fish from Leilani? Hi, Leilani. Uh, I'm going to start from a culinary, well, from a, from a health perspective, uh, skin, its purpose is to keep the bad stuff out and the good stuff in, right? And so it is sort of the, the battle zone between the out and the in. Skin to me can, some of, some toxicity can accrue right beneath the skin. Uh, this is particularly true of freshwater species and lakes where there's uh, PFAS, uh, dioxin issues, uh, legacies of, of farming and pesticides, um, and river fish as well, where there's been industrial dumping, uh, as well as in some saltwater species. Uh, some of those can accrue in that bloodline tissue that is just in that sort of laminated layer of fat that's just beneath the skin. And so when you're eating the skin, you're eating all of that. In the vast majority of species, that is not an issue. Uh, for anyone. Speaking from a culinary standpoint, here's why I don't tend to eat skin that often. Because the heat that you need to apply to skin to get it to be desirable, meaning crispy, uh, is much higher than the amount of heat that optimally is applied to the flesh of the fish. Right. So if you're trying to caramelize and crisp up that salmon skin, chances are you're going to overcook a little bit of the salmon that's beneath it and sacrifice the quality of that flesh, the eating quality of that flesh in order to get the skin. So if you succeed, hey, that's great. Uh, but oftentimes uh, that skin doesn't really necessarily evenly crisp. Uh, I mean, I, I worked in a restaurant. I figured out how to make it do so <laughs> all the time. But if, if you're at home cooking for four and you've got a pan and you're rushed, et cetera, it can be difficult to get it right. And non-crisp skin isn't really that appetizing. It's a little bit gummy uh, and I just, I don't prefer it. If it's steamed fish, I actually do like that. That gelatinous, wonderful texture is something that you're actually going for, that you want to achieve. Uh, but in most times I, uh, I go after perfectly cooking the flesh of the fish more so than caramelizing that flesh, or that skin. I do, however, when I buy fish with the skin on, I cook it with the skin on always. Why? Well, because that skin is a protective barrier, right? It helps keep the moisture in. 
on the flesh of a fish fillet as much as it does in a live fish. So in that way, it protects the flesh from those high heats. It protects against moisture loss because anytime you cut something, you're creating more surface area, you're rupturing cells, you're creating more opportunity for moisture, nutrient loss, etc. So keep the skin on, aim for perfectly cooked flesh. And if the skin comes along with it and is delectable, awesome. Congrats. All right, folks, it's been a really fun, challenging afternoon. I really appreciate all of you. Please let us know what topics you might like us to explore next in on one of our upcoming events. And as always, I am grateful for you. I hope that you will show some gratitude for the food that we are so fortunate to eat. Show somebody in this world that you love them by cooking for them, feeding, feeding them, and love yourself by feeding yourself good, healthy foods. Cheers. We'll see you again soon. Bye.